Welcome back there, boys and girls. I've got a little lecture for you for our, our more not school, school, not school, school time. This one's about Mendelian genetics. So we're going to take what we've been learning about with the central dogma. We're going to connect it to uh, genetic problems and public at uh, genetics problems and Punnett squares, which I know you've done some last year. So this should be a nice, good reintroduction to them. They're called Mendelian traits because this young sir, Gregor Mendel, he's the person who discovered them. Uh, a little bit of background, he was a mathematician. He was also uh, a monk, you know, lived in a monastery, copied the Bible for free time in an area that we now call, uh, you know, the Czech Republic. In 1866, he published the experiments we're going to talk about, a little bit of his methodologies later today, and how it led to him basically using math to measure and define all the rules, all the laws for heredity. Remember, when it's a law, we're describing our observations. Usually does that with math. He did it with math. We're going to do it with words. But before we can talk about that, we need to just quickly revisit the central dogma. So here we are in the notes. Boom. Notice there's somewhere on the screen, maybe here, maybe there, maybe all over. What controls our traits? So first, 1A. Our traits are controlled by proteins. And these proteins are made by ribosomes. You know, good review so far. The DNA has all those instructions to make all the proteins. So the DNA has all the instructions to make all these proteins. So our traits are indirectly controlled by the DNA. Right, because it's going to be this protein down here that's responsible for our traits. In order to get there, we have uh, the instructions in the DNA. However, in order to do that, the code in the DNA needs to be read, and the DNA is in the nucleus. The ribosomes are not in the nucleus. So in order for our DNA to be used, it must be transcribed into mRNA. We call that transcription. And then it has to be translated into amino acids, right, like these amino acids up here, by the ribosome. We call that translation. And that should hopefully take care of all of number one. Now back to Mendel and his pea plants. Like I said earlier, he was a mathematician and he was a monk, M-O-N-K, you know, was a monastery, stuff like that. He discovered the main uh, principles, the main laws behind genetics, and he did it by uh, playing around with pea plants. Before we get into uh, his peas, it's worth mentioning that most traits do not follow these rules. Mendel got very lucky when he discovered his, uh, his rules with the pea plants. Most traits don't follow these rules. However, there's no way to really understand the more complicated traits without first understanding what we call Mendelian traits. So that's what they're called here for 2D. They call Mendelian traits, you know, because Mendel discovered them, Mendel published about them. So it's a nice homage to a very, very smart dude who figured out all this stuff before we even knew what a cell was. Kind of crazy, but true. Let's talk about peas. For those of you that have never grown uh, pea plants in your garden, if we look at uh, their traits, most of the traits come in two varieties. Let's just look at the height of the pea plant. So Mendel conducted his research, like I said, using pea plants. There's two varieties of pea plant. They can either be tall, like that one right there, very tall. Uh, if you stake up a pea plant, give a nice fence to climb, they'll get like six feet tall. They could also be short, which is also known as the dwarf pea plant they will be about three and a half, four feet tall. It doesn't matter how much fertilizer, how much water, how much sunlight they get, they will only ever be maximum four feet tall or they'll be like six feet tall. That's it. There's no, there's no medium, there's no in between. Pea plants are not like humans. They don't have like, like I'm pretty tall and like some people are real tall and then there's medium, there's like super short, tiny people. Pea plants do not do that. It's either six foot tall, four foot tall, that is it, no in between. No in between at all. What Mendel did to try to figure out like what made the pea plants be tall versus what made the pea plants be short, 
or uh, there's also purple white flowers, green and yellow peas, a green and yellow pods, inflator constricted, radio axial buds, a whole bunch of other stuff. But what he did was he, he did what's called selective breeding. So 3C, Mendel used selective breeding to control the inheritance of his plants. He'd actually go around with like a, like a little paintbrush, collect the pollen off of one flower, put it onto the female part of the flower that he wanted that, that plant to breed with, that he wanted to cross them with. And he had like little hoods he'd put over the pea plant flowers to stop any like incidental pollination. P.S. That's what pollen's for is for flowers to have sexual relations with other flowers. Think about that when your allergies are going off. And you're like, oh no, maybe I got the corona. No, it's just allergies. Oh, I don't know. I can't be sure. He would also do what's called self-fertilization. So he would also regularly self-fertilize plants. Let's say he wanted this plant. He wanted to see what happened if he took the genes from this plant and mixed them with the exact genes from this plant. He would do the same thing, just take the, the, the paintbrush, get the pollen from one flower, and put it onto a different flower on the same plant. That's called self-fertilization because every flower on this plant should be having the same genes as every other flower. So let's look at some of his crosses when he was cross-breeding some of these plants. So he could take a tall plant, cross it with a tall plant, and all the plants, surprise, were tall. Tall plants crossed with tall plants yielded tall plants. Did the same thing with two short plants. He makes a short plant with another short plant. He got short plants. And I know uh, none of that is very impressive so far. Yes, tall plants make tall plants and short plants make short plants. Here's where it gets weird. He took a tall plant. He mixed it with a short plant. He crossed them. And he got tall plants. Tall plants. Again, no medium. There, there, there's no medium. But he looked at it and went, okay, so tall and tall makes tall. Short and short makes short. What Tall and, and short makes tall? What's, what's going on here? What's going on here? What it seems like is happening is the tall trait is covering up the short trait in the offspring because we've got the tall trait that showed short. And it's not like most tall, some short, all tall, no short, no medium at all. Let's flip that page. Because of the whole tall, short, making tall plants thing, Mendel came up with a, with a couple rules and, and a couple terms. First, he came up with this word called alleles which we know are versions of a gene. We already talked about those way back when, talking about those sequences of genes. You get one version from mom, one version from dad. He was able to figure that out. We've seen it happen, but for Mendel, he just called them copies of these factors. He thought that there was some kind of tall factor making plants tall and a short factor making sh plants short. And there seemed to be two versions, two copies present in this plant because it has tall and it has short, but it came out tall. He also, because of this happening with the all tall, he came up with what he called the principle of dominance. We usually call it the law of dominance. So the law of dominance, by the way, that's, that's 5B now, 5B. The law of dominance says one allele is always going to be dominant over the other allele. So one version of the gene is dominant over the other version of the gene. We call that other version of the gene recessive. That's what goes in the parenthesis. The recessive allele is expressed only when it's paired with another recessive allele. The only time you'll see short is when you mix two shorts. You'll see tall when you mix two talls, but you also see tall when you mix tall and short. That's the principle of dominance. It takes two recessive alleles to show the recessive, but it only takes one dominant allele to show the dominant. It's going to cover up the recessive allele. So let's talk about the F1 cross, which is what uh, came next. So the F here stands for filial, which means uh, sisters or brothers, siblings, basically, because these plants would be siblings. So if you start here with the tall and short, these would be what are called the parents. We'll use a letter P to represent the parents. So that's what goes in the first 6A. P is used to represent the parents. Then he's going to take this, this generation here, the filial generation, this is called the F1. He's going to self-fertilize them. So he took the F1, he crossed it with itself. 
self-fertilization. Self-fertilizing the F1 leads to what is called the F2 generation. So here at the top again, we have our parents. Parents are mixed to make an F1. F1 gets mixed to make an F2. Make sure in addition to having these on the blanks, get these labeled on your picture on the notes as well, please. Get these labeled on your picture. P for parents, F1 for the first filial generation, F2 for the second filial generation. I usually think F as an offspring. And he noticed when he did this, mixed parents, this would be a 6D, mixed parents, so a tall and a short parent, resulted in an F1 that are all tall, all the same. However, self-fertilized F1 from those mixed parents, that results in a mixed F2. Ooh. And that's where things get really interesting because you'll notice that we end up having for about every three tall plants, we'd have one short plant. This is a very common ratio. You have probably talked about it last year called the three to one ratio. Mendel's actual numbers are here. You'll see he got 2.84 to one, pretty close to three to one. Remember, uh, there's this probability, so it's not always gonna be exactly three to one. It's, you know, coin flips and whatnot. But anyway, based on all this, and all these seven other Mendelian pea plant traits, Mendel was able to come up with a whole bunch more rules because he did that same sort of experiment that we just talked about for all of these, and every time it came out showing the same thing, roughly three to one when he'd look at the F2. Weird, weird, weird. Our gene, that's a segment of DNA that codes for a trait. He, again, just called them factors. The allele, right, those are the versions of a gene. Mendel called them copies of the factors. Remember, the alleles, they're versions of the gene. You inherit them from your parents, so every organism has two. That's one from each parent. And I believe that takes us all the way through 7B, and it is, again, time to flip it a page. Flip it a page. 7C, we're talking about gametes which he called like packages of vitality, which is whatever that means. But we know that they're small cells used for reproduction, right? They have half the amount of DNA. They have half the amount of DNA. So small cells with half the DNA that the parents use to pass down the allele from the parent to the offspring. That's why you get one allele for each gene because we're talking about the egg and the sperm, right? That we talked about like a couple weeks ago. One from mom, one from dad, that's one allele each. So that should take us all the way to this picture right up in here. Yeah. This picture does a very nice job representing uh, the second law that Mendel came up with, the law of segregation. On your diagram, please label the F1. This is that same F1 from that cross we just did, right? Our tall plants that are gonna end up having a mix of tall and short plants as their babies. But when we're looking at the alleles, which, spoiler alert, we represent them with single letters. Looking at our alleles, the law of segregation says that when the gametes here are formed, the two alleles for each trait are going to separate from each other. So the big T and the little t will not be passed down together from this parent. They will get separated. You will either pass down the big T or the little t. So in the gametes, it should look like this, right? Big T, little t, they segregate from each other. These are the two possible gametes from this parent. This parent also has two different alleles, big T, little t, so there's two possible alleles down here. This is the law of segregation. When gametes are formed, the two alleles for every trait will separate from each other. Then, during reproduction, the segregated alleles are going to recombine which is what all these arrows are for. So you just put the big T there, and that big T there, and that big T there, and uh, that little T there, little T, little T, little T. It looks like that, okay? It looks like that. See, big T, big T, big T, little T, big T, little T, little T, 
little p. They recombine. We know this happens during fertilization. P.S. Remember, that is now called our F2 generation. So please label your diagram with the F2 generation. For those of you following along last year, you remember this is labeled as segregation. This is also what happens during meiosis. Right? You talked about that in eighth grade. I'm meiosis. Notice again we have half the alleles because the gametes have half the DNA. That should get us all the way through eight. And now, instead of drawing this diagram every time, we can do instead to figure out what's going to happen here. We can use what's called a Punnett square. So this is with green and uh, yellow peas. If we take two F1 yellows, so those would be the uh, big Y, little y, you can actually fill them in on the Punnett square. And you use the Punnett square. I know, stop filling in the Punnett square. Let, fill in the blanks first. Use the Punnett square. Or they are used to predict the outcome of genetic crosses. That's what we call this when we, when we crossbreed or cross-pollinate these two plants. It's called a cross. Here's our law of segregation being shown. The parental alleles, right, from mommy and daddy, they get put on the outside of the box. One parent goes on the top. One parent goes on the side. In this case, both parents have the same genes, so it doesn't matter which one goes on the top and which one goes on the side. What if they had different alleles? Guess what? It still doesn't matter if which one goes on the top or which one goes on the side, as long as you just put one on the top and one on the side. Notice I didn't take this little Y and put it up here because that little Y came from that little Y and that parent's on the side. It's all good either way you do it. Your choice every time go you. So you put the parental alleles on the outside, then the filial alleles, the offspring, are formed on the inside of the box. That is 9C. So the offspring are formed on the inside of the box. You do it using the time-honored classic dropping and sliding. You'll drop this Y down, you'll slide this Y over. Gives you big Y, big Y inside there. You'll drop this Y down. You'll slide this Y over. Notice, though, which Y gets written first. I said drop the little Y first, but the big Y that I said slide second, that one got written first. The reason why we do that is, that, is uh, the dominant allele always gets written first. It just looks nicer, don't you think? Uh, I think it's like, uh, like um, out of respect for the dominance of the dominant allele. It always goes first. Just like I always go first, the dominant allele. Always goes first. So even though I said drop and slide, always write the dominant allele first. Here, right, drop down that big Y, slide over the little Y, drop down the little Y, slide over the little Y. That's how you fill in the Punnett square. I know you've done these before. This should be a nice review. Speaking of the Punnett square, if you haven't already done so, fill in uh, 9D with all possible genetic outcomes are shown inside the Punnett square. There's nothing that could happen under normal Mendelian circumstances that is not shown in this square. And then go ahead and fill in the square. Fill in the square in your notes. And don't forget to drop and slide. While you're dropping and sliding, remember, inside the box here, these are the offspring that you're forming. So drop and slide, I like that one because it also, DAS stands for dial A stork. You know, because that's where the babies come from. The mommy plant, the daddy plant. They love each other very much. They call the stork, and the stork fills out a Punnett square. Now it's time to talk about uh, some more of the terminology going inside this Punnett square. Inside the Punnett square, on that last slide, you notice we had genotypes and phenotypes, so we need to talk about what those are. A genotype, named because it's pretty much the type of genes, it's a genotype, typo gene, that's which alleles the organism inherited. On the last Punnett square was a big Y, big Y, big Y, little Y, et cetera, et cetera. I guess little Y, little Y is the only other et cetera, isn't it? So these are what are shown inside the Punnett square. Your options here for genotypes, they could be homozygous, which I noticed I misspelled in my notes, but it's spelled correctly on here. So make sure you spell it correctly uh, at home, those of you. Homozygous. Homozygous happens when both alleles are the same. Remember, the word homo means same. Homozygous, 
same zygote. Oh, like from the egg and the sperm is it? Yes, like the zygote. So the alleles are both the same. That's homozygous. There's two two different versions of homozygous genotypes. They could be dominant, so we call that one homozygous dominant. That would be big Y, big Y. Or, and in the case of this plant, that'd be the yellow peas. Or, and you have to flip the page, you could have homozygous recessive, which is the little y, little y. You have homozygous dominant, big Y, big Y. Homozygous recessive, little y, little y. You could also have heterozygous, which hetero means different, so here the alleles are different. That's the other genotype. And this one would be the big Y, little y. So we got homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, heterozygous. Notice I didn't say heterozygous dominant or recessive. There's only, that, that's it. It's just heterozygous, big Y, little y. There's also phenotypes. Oh boy. Phenotypes are the physical appearance. Here, the, the f in there. Phenotypes are the physical appearance. This is one of the last root words we did before we went on break. It means to show. So phenotype is what shows, how it looks, how it appears. When you're doing phenotypes, you're going to use descriptive words. We're talking adjectives. In the case of the color of the peas, you can either have yellow peas which is also why we're using the letter Y. Big Y, big Y will be yellow. Big Y, little Y will also be yellow because the principle of dominance. The other color P are the color that you're more used to seeing, the green peas. In fact, I, I wager if someone served you yellow peas, you'd probably look at them as if, uh, the, where the heck did these peas come from? I'm not interested in these weird, gross yellow peas. Don't worry, they taste exactly the same as the green peas, which is delicious, yeah, because peas are delicious. However, the other phenotype is green. And notice we're using lowercase y's. Why? Because that way we know that it goes with the capital Y. The allele letter always gets picked by whatever the dominant version of the trait is. So we got big Y's for yellow, little Y's for green, because that's the recessive version of this same gene. Now you've got yourself a sweet, sweet Punnett square there. Go ahead and uh, recopy your Punnett square. Here it is from the previous page. And you can, you can uh, get it from the screen here. So you got your big Y, big Y, drop and slide, big Y, big Y, big Y, little Y, right? Big Y, little Y, little Y, little Y. Same Punnett square from the previous page because we've got the same heterozygous parents. Ooh, we can use that word now. Fun. I just want to go through and show you uh, how these shake down in the Punnett square. So we got our homozygous dominant, big Y, big Y. You also have your homozygous recessive. There it is, little Y, little Y. And we also have our heterozygous, big Y, little Y. Notice, ooh, we got two of those. How exciting. How exciting. Maybe you want to draw some arrows or something, something to remind you that that is called homozygous dominant. That's called homozygous recessive. These two are called heterozygous. So that's how the genotypes look. The genotypes are what we actually write inside of there. But you also will have the phenotypes shown inside the square. We just, we don't usually write them. On mine, they're written. If it helps you when you're doing genetics problems, go ahead and write the phenotypes in the square. However, you could probably look at it and remind yourself that uh, anything with a big Y is going to be yellow. And anything with a little Y is going to be green. Now, it may not look it on your screen, but it definitely looks it on my screen. These three yellows are the same yellow. I know they're the same yellow because I legit copy-pasted this yellow P into these boxes to make all three of this. Keep in mind, the heterozygous big Y, little Y will be just as yellow as the big Y, big Y. Just like with tall versus short plants, there's no greenish yellow. There's no super yellow. It's either yellow yellow, yellow, or not yellow, that's it. Those are your only options. So that's how you can look at the genotypes and see the phenotypes.
all of this is building towards being able to finally answer some genetics questions. You'll notice you've got one, two, three practice genetics questions for, with not a lot of space, one, two, three, four practice genetics questions right there on your paper. Uh, ratios and probabilities this is step 11 before we get to the little ones. When you're asked to do a ratio in a genetics problem, all you have to do is count the number of individuals with each trait inside the Punnett square. For example, this square is showing what Mendel found with tall versus short and what Mendel found with yellow versus green peas, a three to one ratio. We call it three to one ratio because it is three yellow to one green. So those of you that have now jumped down to number one down there, Punnett square above shows a cross between two heterozygous pea plants. What's the phenotype ratio? You would write on your paper three yellow to one green. You put a little colon in between them, or you can say three yellow, one green on two lines. Either way, that's how uh, you're going to want to write these. Unless otherwise instructed, or you just have a tiny blank where clearly you're just going to be writing numbers, you want to write three what to one what. Otherwise, you're going to get the be more specific stamp stamped on your paper di digitally because we're not, we're not together. So that is a phenotype ratio. We can also look at the probability. The probability, back up to 11b, that's how likely a trait is to appear in your offspring. So in the case of this one, you have a 75% chance of having yellow offspring and a 25% chance of having green offspring. That would be the answer to question number two squeezed down there. What, is the, uh, what are the phenotype probabilities? 75% yellow, 25% green. Now I know, for the math nerds in the room, you're sitting there like, well, technically a ratio and a probability, and ratio is a probability, and a probability is a ratio. <laughs> Listen, if you're asked in a genetics problem for a ratio, this is what they want to see. If you're asked for a probability in a genetics problem, this is what they want to see. Those are what we call the phenotype ratios. Oh boy, look what's next. Genotype ratios, yay! So in the genotype ratios, you still just count the number of individuals. So this is a one to two to one ratio. What I mean by that is you got one big Y, big Y, to two big Y, little Ys, to one little Y, little Y. Or say it a different way, one homozygous dominant for every two heterozygous for every one homozygous recessive. That would be the answer to question three right there. One big Y, big Y, to two big Y, little Ys, to one little Y, little Y. The probability is still how likely the trait is to appear. So you're looking at it, and instead of lumping all three yellow together, we're going to separate them based on genotype like we did up here. So you have a 25% chance having big Y, big Y, a 50% chance having big Y, little Y, and a 25% chance of having little Y, little Y. Sorry, there's not a lot of room there for number four. Uh, just sort of squeeze it in there above the big words that come next. So this is what Mendel found for all seven of those traits. However, there were seven traits. What happens if you're looking at more than one trait? Then what? Oh, man. Stuff gets really, really intense then. When Mendel looked at more than one trait at a time, he uh, defined what is called the law of independent assortment, which is basically just explaining that yellow peas don't go with yellow pea pods. Look at the tray here. You could have yellow or green peas, and the pod colors could be green or yellow. However, just because you have the dominant version of one does not mean you will get the dominant version of the other. There are two separate traits. They get inherited independently of each other. And they show uh, what comes out to be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. What? Nine yellow peas with a green pod for every three yellow peas with a yellow pod for every three green peas with a green pod for every one green pea with a yellow pod. Wait, where do we, where do we put it? Relax, we're getting to the parts of the notes. This is stuff you're gonna look at next year in biology when you do dihybrid crosses. I just wanted you to be ready for it. So let's talk about the law of independent assortment. Allele P 
pairs for different traits separate from one another when the gametes are made. So allele pairs for different traits do not get passed down together. Instead, they do so independently from what the others do. Oh, see what's in the, they assort themselves independently. I see what we're doing with the words. What that means is the green pea needs to have a chance to go with either the yellow pod or the green pod. So that's 12B. The green piece could go with either the yellow pod or the green pod. And same for the yellow pea. The yellow pea could go with either allele for the uh, yellow pod or the green pod. Basically, what we're saying here is one trait does not determine another. The inheritance is different every single time. That's the law of independent assortment which we learned last year, right, when you talked about meiosis in eighth grade. Here it is, all of Mendel's three laws all put together. The law of segregation, that's actually anaphase from meiosis. We're separating those alleles away from each other. And then independent assortment, because when they line up in metaphase, they, they can line up any which way, so they can line up like that, or they can line up like that. And when they line up those two ways, they'll segregate in all these different ways. And then, because you know we're randomly selecting these gametes when it's time for reproduction, it gets real weird. See all the arrows going all over the place here? And you see down here at the bottom that it's showing the principle of dominance, right? This one is looking at a purple versus white flower. So as a quick recap, Mendel bred some pea plants, and while doing so, discovered some basic rules that he published. Traits that follow these are called the Mendelian traits because they're following Mendel's three laws. We're going to dive more into some Mendelian traits as we go on through the unit. Next year, you'll even get to expand it, start talking about some weird ones, which would be non-Mendelian traits where stuff gets whew, real weird. Because, as it turns out, most traits that we think of as traits are not Mendelian traits. That's it. Thank you guys for watching. Keeping along with the notes. Whew! Go Corona, go! It's over! It's over!